So tonight we'll start with the reading of, of uh, the cursing of the fig tree in St. Matthew's Gospel. And then we'll all look at the parallel verses in uh, St. Mark's Gospel. So it's Matthew chapter 21, verses 18 through 22. Then if time permits tonight, we'll also do G uh, the questioning of Jesus' authority uh, by the chief priests and the, the uh, elders. In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but leaves only. And he said, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, truly, I say to you, if you faith and never doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Now, the corresponding passage in Mark is uh, chapter 11, verses 12 through 14, and then again, 20 through 26. Um, Mark punctuates the cursing of the fig tree or separates it into two segments that are um, broken up by the closing of the temple. So Mark chapter 11, 12 through 14. On the following day when from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And we have the cleansing of the temple. And then the following day, another encounter with the fig tree in verse 20, 20, uh, yeah, in verse 20. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Master, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you receive it, and you will. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. So, with Mark, a somewhat greater emphasis on prayer and faith than in Matthew. We'll uh, we'll discuss how that's related to the fig tree, if at all, since that's something of a, a sticking point for many interpreters. But the first thing is, how is this related to um, his presence in Jerusalem? How does this fit in? Anyone have any any thoughts? So Jesus has, as the king, has entered Jerusalem, right? And so Jerusalem has to 
make, and particularly the religious elites, have to make a decision. In cleansing the temple, Jesus showed that he was the Messiah with authority over the temple, and in fact, the, the Messiah who replaces the temple. And so the fig tree then, and, and clearly, um, as we're going to see in, in the questioning of Jesus' authority, um, and, and as we saw in his encounter uh, after the healings with, with uh, the temple, uh, authorities that are hostile. And so parable of the fig tree, or it's not a parable, Jesus' action in um, cursing the fig tree and causing it to wither really is scatological. It's, it's a, a, a sort of announcement uh, in in uh, form of the coming judgment. So then later, right before the, the uh, all of that discourse, we're going to see Jesus explicitly pronouncing judgment on, on Jerusalem uh, and the temple. So this episode falls between uh, two temple centers of uh, the purification of the temple and the healing in the temple uh, on the one hand, and the, the, the questioning of Jesus' authority by, um, by the Jewish religious authorities, the temple authorities on the other. So, the cursing of the tree suggests a prophetic act uh, of judgment against the is that clear mm -hmm. in other words if they don't believe in who jesus is um they're God will not hear what they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's right in front of them, and he's trying to make a point, and they're giving him a hard time. Also, also remember that this goes back to um, to the leaven of the Pharisees and and uh, and and the Sadducees. Uh, and back to you know, their request for a sign, and no sign being given because they themselves are the sign. So, as we we discuss the fig tree, um, so keep that in mind, and then we'll we'll get back to it, especially when we discuss what appears to be really act as Jesus talks about prayer and uh, receiving what you ask in prayer, but, but actually isn't a disconnect. Um, so some context, um, fig trees uh, in Palestine bear fruit uh, multiple times a year, but um, at Passover, Generally, um, fig trees are be have leaves, but they generally lack a full covering, and therefore they also don't have fruit. So, in this encounter with the fig tree, Jesus had evidently crossed a tree that was uh, unusually uh, leafy for this time of year. So the expectation, of course, if you find a fig tree that's full of leaves, is that it's um, going to have figs, right? There should be fruit. Fig trees are supposed to be produce fruit, but this fig tree 
has no fruit. It's really just, you know, sort of a cheese. It's a tempting fig tree that's unable to deliver. So it's, you know, false advertising, representing the character and the nature of fig trees. So it offered promise without fulfillment. That's important in eventually in, in next week or the following week, we're going to see the parable of the two sons, one of whom who were asked to go and, and work in in the uh, the farm. The first son refuses and then does it. You know, the second promises to and then doesn't. Um, so it's the, the second son is in many ways a, a mirror image or an image of this this encounter with the fig tree. He, he uh, uh, promises but doesn't fulfill. So what so what the Bible, um, the Didache, says, uh -huh. uh, in the footnotes, it says that the, the story stresses the need to bear fruit, even if it's not in season. And and I guess the Pharisees and the Sadducees weren't bearing any fruit because they were they were too busy questioning what Jesus was doing instead of believing that he was he was doing what needed to be done mm -hmm. yeah right so the fig tree is a symbol of um faith and works Um, we'll probably read the passage again later, but let's look at Micah. Uh -huh. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Mm -hmm. Woe is me, for I have become as when the summer fruit has been gathered, as when the vintage has been gleaned. There is no cluster to eat, no first ripe fig which my soul desires. Godly man has perished from the earth, and there is none upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood, and each hunts his brother with a net. Their hands are upon what is evil to do it diligently. The prince and the judge ask for a bribe, and the great man utters the evil desire of his soul. Thus they weave it together. The best of them is like a briar, the most upright of them, a thorn hedge. The day of their watchmen, of their punishment, has come. Now their confusion is at hand. Put no trust in a neighbor, have no confidence in a friend. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your bosom. For the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. That's also very much like brother or father, son will rise up against father or whatever in the uh, in the missionary discourse. Um, so so we go from no fruit, uh, no first ripe fig which my soul desires because the godly man has perished from the earth. So, so the absence of fruit on, on the fig tree 
is a symbol for um, and a uh, lack of works, for a lack of faith, for a lack of discipleship, for a lack of following after God. So in, in a lot of ways, that, that verse from Micah forms uh, the context um, for for this encounter, this cursing of the fig tree. So, does anyone have any thoughts about the uh, cursing of the fig tree? Like, does it seem excessive? Does it seem a little bit outlandish? The cursing of a poor, innocent fig tree? <laughs> I like figs. <laughs> but yeah, poor little fig tree. <laughs> but it's a warning, right? It's a warning. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's in some sense outlandish, but let's also take a look at um, I guess you could say it's a parable in action. Mm -hmm. um, it's something outlandish that is supposed to draw attention to something else. And so in this case, it's not about the fig tree itself. It's about uh, works and it's about service to God and reflecting God or alternately misrepresenting God. So that's an important you know, thing which deserves an outlandish you know, context or message. So let's take a look at, actually, I, I didn't write down the verse. What's the book? Uh, Isaiah chapter 20. Oh, it, it's the whole chapter, but it's only a few verses. that the commander-in-chief who was sent by Sargon, the king of Assyria, came to Ashdod and fought against it and took it. At that time, the Lord had spoken by Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, go and lose the sackcloth from your loins and take off your shoes from your feet. And he had done so, walking naked and barefoot. The Lord said, as my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot for three years as a sign and a portent against Egypt and Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians' captives and the Ethiopians' exiles, both the young and old, naked and barefoot, with buttocks and covered, to the shame of Egypt. They shall be dismayed and confounded because of Ethiopia their hope and of Egypt their boast. And the inhabitants of this coastland will say in that day, Behold, this is what has happened to those in whom we hoped and to whom we fled for help to be delivered from, from the king of Assyria. And we, how shall we escape? So Isaiah is ordered to walk around with no clothes to deliver the prophetic message. It probably did a great deal of attention. <laughs> let's take a look at it. Let's see if I can find it easily. 
uh, Jeremiah chapter 27. Verse 1, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Thus the Lord said to me, make your thongs and yoke bars and put them on your neck. Send word to the king of Edom, the king of Moab, the king of the sons of Ammon, the king of Tyre and the king of Sidon by the hand of the envoys who have come to Jerusalem, to Zedekiah, king of Judah. Give them this charge of their, for their masters. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, this is what you shall say to your masters. It is I who by my great power and my outstretched arm have made the earth with the men and animals that are on the earth, and I give it to whomever it seems right to me. Now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. And I have given him also the beasts of the field to serve him. All the nations shall, shall serve him and his son and his grandson until the time of his own land comes. Then many nations and great kings shall make him their slave. The prophecy goes on. But the, the point is that Jeremiah is ordered to wear a yoke because he's delivering word of subservience and captivity. So it's a sort of a parable in, in, in action that echoes the uh, God's judgment. Um, there are other similar um, parables in action. In Ezekiel chapter 3, Ezekiel is ordered to eat a scroll. In Ezekiel chapter 4, he's ordered to lay siege to a place city. In Ezekiel chapter 24, he's told not to mourn the death of his wife. And in, in uh, Hosea, the early part of Hosea, Hosea is told to marry Gomer, who is a prostitute and represents uh, the infidelity of, of uh, the Israelites. So, so it's an uncharacteristic action that's intended to draw attention to uh, the symbolic message. So, so questions? So here Jesus is being deliberately outrageous. In some ways, he, as he was, I think, deliberately outrageous in entering Jerusalem, assuming he, that he was sitting on, as Matthew says, on two asses. Mm -hmm. So the symbolism here, fruitful figs as well as fruitful grapevines are a symbol of peace and prosperity. So the absence of 
fruitful figs and the absence of grapes is a symbol really of its opposite, that there is not peace, that there is not prosperity. And throughout St. Matthew's Gospel, there's been an emphasis on fruit as a, uh, as a symbol of good works. Mm -hmm. And so John the Baptist in, in chapter three said, bear fruit that befits repentance. And so your repentance should be reflected in your works. Mm -hmm. If there's, there are no works to reflect repentance, then there can be repentance. It's not genuine repentance. It's lip service. In chapter 7, Jesus says, you know prophets by their fruits. In chapter 12, a tree is known by its fruit. And then later in the parable of the wicked tenants, the kingdom of God will be given to the nation producing the fruits. So this is a action that is then tied to the two parables of the, the, uh, the two sons and the wicked tenants in the vineyard who refused to hand over the crop and kill everyone who the landowner sends to collect it until he sends his son and they kill him as well. So then let's also look at the imagery of the uh, fig tree in the Old Testament, where it's a prophetic symbol for the life God expects his people to live, the works he expects them to perform. Let's take a look at Jeremiah chapter 8. Let's start uh, chapter 8, verse 8, and read through verse 13. Okay. How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? But behold, the false pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. The wise men shall be put to shame. They shall be dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord, and what wisdom is in them. Therefore, I will give lives to others and their fields to conquerors, because from the least to the greatest, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. From prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among the fallen. When I punish them, they shall be overthrown, says the Lord. 
when I would gather them, says the Lord. There are no grapes on the vine nor figs on the fig tree. Even the leaves are withered. And what I gave them has passed away from them. So the barrenness of figs and grapes is a symbol of idolatry, is a symbol of false prophecy. Um, the scribes are involved. It's a symbol of bad Bible interpretation, a bad interpretation of Torah. Um, the symbol of a complete turning away from God and self-servingness. So we've seen that that basic accusation as part of Jesus' cleansing of the temple the, of worship to God and has become a, a, um, a house of self-aggrandizement the priests those who are supposed to serve God and serve the people are instead serving themselves. Let's take a look also at Jeremiah chapter 24. Verses one through ten, which is the whole chapter. After Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken into exile from Jerusalem Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, together with the princes of Judah, the craftsmen and the smiths and had brought them to Babylon, the Lord showed me this vision. Behold, two baskets of figs placed before the temple of the Lord. One basket had very good figs, like first ripe figs, but the other basket had very bad figs, so bad that they could not be eaten. And the Lord said to me, what do you see, Jeremiah? I said, figs, the good figs, very good and the bad figs very bad, so bad they cannot be eaten. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so I will regard as good the exiles from Judah, whom I have sent away from this place to the land of the Chaldeans. I will set my eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up, and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. But thus says the Lord, like the bad figs which are so bad they cannot be eaten, so I will treat Zedekiah, the king of Judah, his princes, the remnant of Jerusalem who remain in this land and those who dwell in the land of Egypt. I will make them a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a reproach, a byword, a taunt, and a curse in all the places where I shall drive them. And I will send sword, famine, and pestilence upon them until they shall be utterly destroyed from the land which I gave to them and their fathers. <clears throat> so the uh, the good figs are the remnant who continue to follow God, and the bad figs are those who reject God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
also take a look at Hosea. Chapter 7. Verses 9 and then 16 and 17. Actually, that isn't quite there, right. There isn't a 17, right? Right, there isn't a 17. Huh. Mm -hmm. So, did I say it's it's um, Hosea chapter 9? Did I say oh. 7? Oh, okay. Seven. Yeah, I did say 7. I'm sorry. That's so, okay. Hosea 9. Verses mm -hmm. 10 and 16 and 17. Okay. Like grapes in the wilderness, I found Israel. Like the first fruit on the fig tree in its first season, I saw your fathers. But they came to Baal Peor and consecrated themselves to Baal, and became detestable like the thing they loved. And jumped in verses 16 and 17. Ephraim is, their root is dried up, they shall bear no fruit. Even though they bring forth, I will slay their beloved children. My God will cast them off, and not listen to him. They shall be wanderers among the nations. So judgment and curse, and uh, as and uh, the, the uh, barren fig tree is a symbol of that. And then the the passage from Micah chapter seven that we read earlier, which is really very closely related to especially with hungering for the fig tree of Jesus' hunger in the morning. Micah 7? Yeah. Should we read that again? Yeah, let's read it again. Um, so seven verses one through six. Woe is me, for I have become as when the summer fruit has been gathered, as when the vintage has been gleaned. There is no cluster to eat, no ripe fig, which my soul desires. So that corresponds really closely to being hungry. And so what does it mean that there is no uh, fig to eat, no vintage to drink? It means that in verse 2, the godly man has perished from the earth. There is none upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood, and each hunts his brother with a net. Their hands are upon what is evil to do it diligently. The prince and the judge ask for a bribe, and the great man utters the evil desire of his soul. Thus they weave it together. The best of them is like a briar, the most upright of them a thorn hedge. The day of their watchmen, of their punishment has come. Now their confusion is at hand. Put no trust in a neighbor, have no confidence in a friend. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your bosom. For the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. 
But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Mm -hmm. oh. A lack of fruitfulness as a symbol of um, sin and distance from the Lord, and also as a symbol of God's uh, coming judgment. So this is an eschatological parable. It's a parable of judgment. So Augustine had argued this is not simply a miracle, but more importantly, it's a prophetic sign. And that a miracle that was consistent with Jesus' other miracles would have caused the tree to bear fruit, which it didn't. So, so it's it's a miracle that's a prophetic sign. So thoughts or comments about that? It really you know, supports the, uh, the theology that you know, if you let Jesus into your heart, you'll be saved. <clears throat> no, works are important too. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so then there's a evidently a, a shift of emphasis from idolatry or bad works or no works or uh, to the power of faith and the power of prayer. So it's often argued that that shift is artificial and is was tacked on by Matthew after the fact. So is that true? What is the relationship between the withering of the fig tree and Jesus' statements about faith and prayer? Like if you have faith and pray, you're gonna, you know, get closer to God and then you're gonna produce um, fruits, you no, know, like better fruit, yeah, better fruits, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, by implication, what are you praying for? Mercy. <laughs> Forgiveness. Giving praise and thanksgiving. I remember the 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 the, um, the um, what Jesus is saying seems rather sweeping. You have faith and never doubt you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. What are you asking for in prayer implicitly? What is the whatever? 
because it's, I mean, the, the most, most common evangelical interpretation is that whatever is anything, and God will give it to you. But there's a, there's a, a really uh, limiting context here. What is the whatever? What are well, what are you asking for? What is the point of this whole parable of the fig tree thing? That if you bear, if you have faith, you will bear good fruit. What do you need? And you will get whatever you need. What do you need for? You may not need. You may not get what you want but you will get what you what you need well, what do you need for good works faith in god what is that called trust um no really it's not trust it's like <laughs> Grace. Oh, grace. Yeah, of course. Grace. <laughs> Jesus is talking about grace. It's not that you pray, you know, God, I want a bigger airplane so I can have a more effective ministry. God, lay some, uh, lay, 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 a, for stuff. <laughs> lay a yacht on me. It's a prayer for grace so that you can accomplish the works that you've been called to accomplish. Mm, mm, mm. The song say, right, your grace is enough for me. <laughs> right. Right. Your grace is enough for me. Exactly. So this is Jesus is talking about grace. Mm. Without grace, we can do nothing. Mm -hmm. And so we need God's grace in order to bear good produce good fruit. And that's what Jesus is saying. So thoughts, comments about that? So here, remember that we're talking about that, that this is a contrast with the uh, Pharisees, the chief priests, the elders, the scribes. And so we've seen in Jesus' condemnation exactly what you know, sort of the problem with them is. On the one hand, they profess a belief in God. They profess faith in God. But on the one hand, so when, when Jesus says, implies that they themselves are the sign, accusing them of idolatry, that they've abandoned the worship of God, of the one true God for something else. So what is that something else? In the cleansing of the temple, we see that that something else is putting the temple, which is intended to be for worship to God, for praise to God, and for building the faith of, of, uh, of the Israelites, as well as for attracting, bringing uh, Gentiles to a knowledge of the one true God. And that mission has been supplanted by self-aggrandizement and pursuit of mammon, that the temple has become a profit center for them, and that's the primary concern. And the whole thing about divorce, back repeatedly throughout, you know, in, in all of the uh, encounters about the meaning of scripture and, and how scripture is to be interpreted, you know, we see that um, that um, especially in, in, in the, the thing of, about divorce, we see a self-serving interpretation of scripture, you know, mm -hmm. that 
that uh, an important incentive for marriage is that you can get divorced easily. Right? So you don't go, you go, you, you go into marriage with, you want to have that assurance of an escape hatch when what you're supposed to be doing is trying to form one flesh with your wife. But instead, you your view of your wife is that she's simply a disposable object. You can't be one flesh, you know, with a disposable object. And so God's will is circumvented by uh, the use of the Bible. And then we see that with the disciples as well, with the issue of has John the Baptist come or has Elijah come? And and for the, the disciples, that seems to be a stumbling block because here evidently is Jesus, the Messiah, but where is Elijah? And they're expecting a literal Elijah, but there is no literal Elijah. It's, there's a typological Elijah. John the Baptist is Elijah. So scripture is being used inappropriately and, and for reasons that are self-serving and that subvert God's will. So, so fundamentally, Jesus' opposition is, is, from Jesus' point of view, they're masquerading as worshipers of God when, in fact, they're idolaters. And idolatry is the most serious sin that one can commit against God. So questions, thoughts, comments about that? Discussion? Does that relate to the um, I mean the the worst sin is against the Holy Spirit, isn't it? Is that the same thing? The sin against the Holy Spirit? It's is it un, um, it's unforg that's that's one that cannot be forgiven. It's a, a sin against the activity of the Holy Spirit and and actually I mean that that's kind of a that's a good point so the, uh, so remember going back to Peter's revelation you are the Christ mm -hmm. the son of the living God so we discussed the significance of the living God as part of that revelation, as opposed to simply the Son of God as part of that revelation, that there that, that there's a difference, that the living God is a God who creates life, who breathes life. And so if we look at, at Genesis, the, the sort of pattern of the, the theology expressed in Genesis is that God the Father, can, if you look at it from a Trinitarian perspective, since there are sort of three things going on. That God the Father conceives, that the Son, who is the Word of God, speaks, and that the Holy Spirit hovers and acts. So it's a threefold process, and in the process, the Holy Spirit breathes light. So the, the problem here in terms of the uh, Jesus, uh, implication that his, his uh, opposition is idolatrous is that they don't see God as active. God 
is inert. Mm -hmm. It's not present in an action. You know, one can argue you know, a rough equivalent from the, the, the 60s is you know, the God is dead movement. And in fact, I mean, if, if you think about it, many Christians believe you know, without knowing it, that God is dead. God is inert. God, you know, created the stuff and now he's he imposed these laws and, you know, we're going to follow them. And But God is fundamentally inert and therefore everything is fundamentally dependent on human action and on us. Hmm. Whereas everything is really dependent on God's grace. And God is the God of the living. God is active. God is present. And so that view that you know, God is, is uh, inert is really a fundamentally destructive one that uh, leads us to substitute ourselves for God's grace and for God. So we become, you know, um, we think enforcers of God's will. And so throughout church history, one of the, the manifestations of that has been, you know, uh, the desire for a a close relationship with the state, you know, so that the state becomes an oppressive institution that enforces God's will upon everybody. And we see that with especially American, white American evangelicalism, you know, that we want to return to being a godly nation and want to return to a godly state when in fact it's a, a godly state is anything but godly and uh, and the godly nation is uh was not very godly a nation of slavery a nation that used atomic weapons a nation of racism a nation that committed genocide on a massive scale against Native Americans. Uh, none of those things are by any remote stretch of the, uh, the imagination godly. So perpetuating the myth really perpetuates more of the same. It's a call to racism. It's a call to genocide. It's a call to force people to pray to God which is bring back prayer in school, which is an abomination. Um, it, it's thoroughly, it's really thoroughly idolatrous because it depends on human action rather than God's will. We elevate ourselves into little gods And so that's. I have a hard time with that one. Which what, one? That that the prayer isn't brought back, because I thought it was a good thing. I thought. Why is it? Why is it good to force people to pray? Nobody was forcing me. That's but I that's it was a good idea. That's no no that's that's the point. Prayer in in school is allowed. It's allowed in religious schools, but also it's allowed as a voluntary, uh, on a voluntary basis in school. That's the point of the, so when, when we're told that prayer has been disallowed in school, it's a lie. It's flatly a lie. Prayer has not been, what has been disallowed is compulsory prayer and obligatory prayer. So a teacher cannot tell you know, the class, we will pray now. That's a violation of people's rights. Hmm. It's also a violation of 
the respect that God has for each individual and the freedom that God gives us to choose him or not choose him. So when you tell people they have to pray, you're forcing them and you're conveying an image of God who is a, a, a harsh taskmaster. God does have no respect for individuals. God has not given us free, freedom to choose. He is imposing prayer on us. That's the message it conveys. And that's a message that fundamentally distorts the, the nature and the image of God. It turns people against God. It's dressed up as being, you know, with piety and 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 everything else, but it's uh, it's not. It's a uh, it's a disguise for really for the work of Satan, and it's based on a lie, which is the most outrageous thing. Now, if you read the Supreme Court decisions. It's very clear that prayer by voluntary groups and organizations is allowed. It's compulsory prayer that's disallowed. And we certainly do not want to force people to, at least, you know, I don't think so. Prayer is supposed to be communication with God, not, you know, grudging, whatever. And we're called to worship God in spirit and in truth, not because we have to. So that's a uh, really important thing, I think. So does that make sense? When you talk about the Supreme Court, it does make sense. In saying that it's still allowed in school, it's just not forced. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I mean, so that, I mean, there are multiple Supreme Court decisions about that. And in fact, one is that you can disallow prayer in school, disallow secular organizations as well. So that's, you know, kind of far reaching. So, you know, th there's a real, there's often a real trap here. I mean, often we tend to assume that if God's name can be attached to something, it's good. But often that's not the case. And we have to look for uh, a, a little bit more deeply, um, you know, to make sure that God is in fact being served and it's the lip who is active here rather than uh, you know, the static God who is inert and whose place we're going to take because evidently the poor guy died and he has to appoint, must have appointed someone uh, in his place, so why not me? So other thoughts, comments, or questions, or discussion? And as, as prophetic action, this is really very sobering, and especially it's stress on good works. Obviously, I was being facetious when you know, I said that um, you know, it provides evidence for 
you're saved if you let Jesus into your heart. Obviously, works are critically important. Works are critically important because as disciples of our Lord, we're called to imitate Christ. Mm -hmm. And when we fail, and the fact is that the world expects us to imitate Christ. So when they see bad actors and they see bad imitations, they immediately that that's a reflection of who God is. So the element of idolatry enters in very strongly because you're as as a supposed disciple, as a supposed worshiper of God, you're misrepresenting God to people. You're displaying an image of some other God. Well, not some other God. You're displaying an image not of God. You're distorting the reflection of God. And that is very serious. So any final thoughts or comments? I'll stop the recording.